Praise the Lord and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to all our online students. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to these um, <clears throat> lectures later on. So what is the course that you've joined this morning called? Kingdom of God and Kingdom Builders, OK? So uh, for those of you who are uh, on the online, you're the, the APC publication Kingdom of God is uh, being posted in the classroom page. So you can access it from there. Um, I hope you have uh, taken some time to read the welcome note and the welcome, I mean, the course introduction, which I posted the classroom page. Um, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Abhishek. And those of you who have not um, read it through, you can take some time to read it. It will just take you five minutes. Okay. And also the course content, the Kingdom of God APC publication is there um, in the classroom. Uh, okay. So um, in this course, we'll be studying two APC publications, which is Kingdom of God and Kingdom Builders, OK? So we'll be studying the Kingdom of God and uh, Kingdom Builders. We'll first study the book uh, Kingdom of God. Um, so even as we delve into uh, this course, uh, my prayer is that each of you will be equipped uh, you know, to uh, understand and know what is the Kingdom mandate and to fulfill the Kingdom mandate for the rest of your lives, OK? And our aim in this course is to see the kingdom of God, you know, be established here on earth. Okay, his will be done through each one of you, right where you are, right where God has placed you, has um, planted you. Uh, so you can extend his kingdom and uh, do his, establish his will here on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So I uh, would encourage all of you to you know, actively listen, engage in discussions, ask questions, uh, basically challenge your understanding. It is uh, through these interactions that we have that we uh, will truly grow and gain a deeper understanding, deeper insights um, uh, into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God's principles. OK, so we will have four assessments for this semester, uh, two from um, the Kingdom of God and uh, two assessments from the Kingdom Builders. And during my lectures, um, you, if you, you'll notice that there'll be a lot of, I'll uh, be giving you a lot of additional content, uh, which is not there, <coughs> sorry, in the, in the publication. So I'm um, doing that because uh, just to encourage your active uh, listening, uh, attentiveness, and also active participation. If I just teach from this textbook, then uh, there's no point. You all can just stay back at home and read it, right? Uh, there will be nothing interesting to come to class. So, um, so just going to give you a lot of additional content, um, especially for the kingdom of God. Okay, so that will just help you to listen attentively, right? Take down notes, and also uh, what I'm giving uh, teaching in class will be. Uh, uh, included in your assessments, okay? So don't wonder where it came from. <laughs> it's all in the lectures, okay? Uh, we'll begin. We'll just pause for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that um, you're a God who is so mindful of us. You're a God who loves us. You're a God who looks upon us as your children, God, that you have called us your heirs, that we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that even as you have saved us from sin and you purchased us with your precious blood, you've redeemed us. You have not redeemed us uh, to be slaves of you, Father, but you have redeemed us to be your sons and daughters in your kingdom. And we are just so amazed at uh, how much you love us, God, and the level that you think of us, God. And we just want to thank you for the 
the, the place that you have placed us, that we are seated in Christ in the heavenly realms. And we want to thank you for that. We thank you, God, that even as we are your sons and daughters, that you have entrusted to us your kingdom, God. You have given us your dominion here on earth and you have given us your kingdom. You have given us the keys of your kingdom, God, uh, the responsibility and the authority, God, to use your name uh, so that we can go out and preach your word and, and baptize people. The name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and we can heal the sick and raise the dead and, um, and uh, 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 cleanse people who are, uh, lead them into salvation and those who are in the stronghold of sin and darkness and bring them into your marvelous light, bring them into the kingdom of God. We want to thank you God for this awesome privilege and this responsibility and Father even as we look into your word we pray Holy Spirit that you would um, reveal to us the truths about your kingdom so that we will be equipped uh, we will be well equipped we will be well established we will know the truths and god the truth will set us free and we will be powerful uh, kingdom builders uh, just building your kingdom and furthering your kingdom here on earth and establishing your will here on earth as it is in heaven we thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name we pray amen So we'll uh, begin with chapter one. Um, the kingdom of God, if you look in the in the Gospels, um, is a major theme uh, throughout the Bible. Okay, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, okay, uh, he began by proclaiming the arrival of what? When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he start he proclaimed the arrival of what? The king, God's kingdom, yes, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And even you see during his final days on earth, before his ascension, we see that he taught about the, what did he teach even before he ascended to heaven? What did he teach his disciples? He taught them about the kingdom of God. Yes, quite obvious, right? Okay, so the early church, we also see that the early church taught and preached from a kingdom perspective, okay? So Jesus pro, uh, proclaimed the arrival of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven, and also, why did you put out the fan? It's very hot, Nelson. It's hot for, are you all feeling hot? Oh, those fans. But these you put, okay. So during his final days on the earth, uh, during his uh, ascension, you know, just before his ascension, he taught about the kingdom of God and also the early church uh, preached or taught from a kingdom mindset, from a kingdom perspective. Okay. Now, if you look at this phrase um, or this term, the kingdom of God, it's mentioned uh, at least about 150 times in the in the Bible, okay? Just as many times as uh, the Bible talks about who we are in Christ, that same number of times it talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So we see that the kingdom of God is a very important, um, uh, you know, a phrase that we need to understand, that we need to know, uh, that we need to work out of and live in our very everyday lives okay so when you uh, are looking at this course the kingdom of god and kingdom builders what are you basically expecting mike uh, online students you can also um, post on the chat or you can uh, unmute yourselves and and speak where's the mic it's here sanjay can you just pass it on to them yeah we are the part of his kingdom and we have to build his kingdom. Okay, earth. we are part of his kingdom and we are here to build his kingdom. What is your expectations of this course? Pass the mic, anyone? What are your expectations from this course? When you look at kingdom of God, what comes to your mind? Or what are you expecting to learn? God's plan? On earth, okay. Online students, to bring down the kingdom of God to rule and reign on the earth through our prayers, okay. Just through our prayers. 
Is it just through our prayers that uh, we bring the kingdom of God, His rule, extend His rule and reign here on earth? Through our lifestyle, through our very lives, through our uh, uh, the ministry that we engage in, okay? The importance of sharing the gospel, okay? Okay, the, the, the people that we engage with, con in contact with, okay? To work for the kingdom of God, yes. Okay, who've not heard the gospel to uh, teach and preach the gospel to them, uh, to fulfill God's agenda, yes, God's mandate, um, to preach and teach and to make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, what else? What is your expectation of this course? It's good to come to any course with some expectation. <laughs> Uh, this is, you know, what happened? What does the Bible say? Without any a vision, people perish. Yeah, without any enthusiasm, without any desire, you will be just bored in the class, right? So, what is your expectation? Can Sister, you... Jesus will be our king. Okay, Lucy says to walk in obedience to God. Okay. We always tend to think uh, kingdom of God is futuristic, but as Jesus says, kingdom of God is here. So yes, it's among we us. always uh, thank you so for that. We always think that kingdom of God is somewhere in the future, but the kingdom of God is here and now, right? Yes. Uh, Andrew says to learn and know what is the kingdom which is there in us. Okay. Uh, to live a life pleasing to Him. Okay. Anything else? Okay, how to how to enhance or further the kingdom of God here on earth? Okay. Okay. Abhishek says, uh, no, I'm not able to hear the online students. Did anyone speak? Can anyone speak now? Can anyone unmute your mics and speak, please? Check, check. Can you speak? No, I can't hear you, Abhishek. Just speak again, please. Uh, hi, Pastor. Good morning. Are you able yeah. to hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yes. Thank you, Abhishek. Yeah. Okay, we didn't turn that on. <laughs> okay. So anyone from the online students want to say anything? Okay. So we see that the kingdom of God is a major theme uh, throughout the Bible. Okay, and um, um, we saw that you know it's mentioned 150 times, the same number of times uh, where it's mentioned about who we are in Christ. So we see that kingdom of God is very, very important, not just because it's mentioned 150 times, but also because what's the other reason? Why is the kingdom of God important from a bi biblical perspective? It's everlasting. The kingdom of God is everlasting. Okay. Okay, to okay, end the kingdom of uh, uh, the devil, yes. Okay. I think you need to give him the mic so that our online students can hear. Yeah, it's difficult to, yeah. Can you say that again, please, from the beginning? So uh, the kingdom of God is diametrically opposite to the kingdom of Satan or mm -hmm. this world, uh, the way this world has been run by the enemy. So understanding the kingdom of God helps us, uh, you know, counter, counter the works or the plans of the enemy in this world. Okay, thank you. I'm saying that, you know, in the, in the New Testament, uh, the phrase kingdom of God is mentioned 150 times, the same amount of time that, you know, who we are in Christ is also mentioned. But uh, so that is so it shows how important the kingdom of God is. But why else is the kingdom of God important for us to look and study from a biblical perspective? I said in the beginning of the class. When Jesus came on the earth, what did he do? 
Jesus he proclaimed the kingdom of God. Yes, he proclaimed the kingdom, of the kingdom of God. Yes, he proclaimed and he spoke about the arrival of the kingdom of God. And also he inaugurated the kingdom of God. Okay. And he proclaimed uh, the arrival of the kingdom of God. And if you look at most of his teachings, all of the most of the parables is talking about the kingdom of God. When, when Jesus starts a parable, how does he start a parable? Most of the parables. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man went to sow his seeds. Okay. So uh, talking from a very kingdom perspective. And even before he ascended into heaven, he teaches about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to his uh, disciples. Okay. Um, so we need to understand where is the kingdom of uh, God? Where? In us. In us, yes. The kingdom of God is in us. Okay, the kingdom of God is here. And we need to recognize that who, who are we in the kingdom of God? We are children of God. We are sons and daughters uh, of the kingdom. Okay. And we have been sown as good seeds in this world. We look at the parable of the, the seeds and the tares. Okay. So we have been sown as good seeds in this world okay so in this study uh, you know we will basically be learning or this study will teach us how to live and operate out of a kingdom of god perspective how to have a kingdom mindset you know in everything that we do uh, is uh, and everything that we say everything that we do is basically an extension of the king's domain here on earth when you say king's domain what do we mean the king's rule, king's reign, his kingdom, right? His rule to be released here on earth in and through us. So God is looking up to us to further his kingdom, to release his kingdom presence, his kingdom reign, his kingdom rule, his kingdom lifestyle here on this earth. And he's looking up to each one of us. And we'll also learn how to fulfill the kingdom of God mandate that is on our life how to fulfill the kingdom mandate that is on our life to see his what is the kingdom mandate basically to see his kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven his kingdom mandate is basically to see his kingdom come his will be done here on earth right where we are okay so when we talk about the kingdom of god we're talking about god as who's the king Yes, God as king, Jesus as the king. And we are talking about the king's domain, the king's rule, the king's reign in the, the, in the sphere that we are in. Okay, So when we talk about the kingdom of God, two aspects, we talk about God as king and we talk about the domain of the king, the rule of the king. Okay, Now the word kingdom in the New Testament, the Greek word is basilia which basically means royalty, rule, uh, uh, the realm of his kingdom or the reign of the kingdom. Okay, So the, uh, the word basilia basically means royalty, rule, reign or the realm of the kingdom. Okay, So kingdom therefore refers to the realm of the king's rule, the reign of the king's rule or the king's domain. Okay, Now when we say the domain of the king what are we basically saying when we're saying the king's domain what are we basically saying the rule the power the government the reign of the king okay so when we are talking about the kingdom of god we are referring to the yes we're talking about the rule and the authority uh, of the king uh, within his domain okay so when we're talking about the kingdom of god we're referring to the realm of his influence and his authority and his government his government his rule so talking about his influence we're talking about his authority and we're talking about his government in the in the domain or the realm that he uh, is overseeing or he is over okay now in the new testament you find two phrases the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. 
Are these two similar words or they're different? Any idea? Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, are they, do they mean the same thing or they're two different things? They mean the same it's thing? It's the same thing. Okay, Gertrude says the same thing. One of them says it's two different things. What about the others? Same? Same? Different? Okay, some say same, some say different. Um, yes, thank you, Deepu. So thank you, Lucy. It's it's same. Actually, uh, you know, sometimes unnecessarily we trouble ourselves trying to <laughs> draw distinctions, um, which is not very evident in the word of God between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So we are trying to, you know, unnecessarily trouble our minds uh, to find out or try to find the distinctions when there is no distinction, every, uh, you know, evident in the word of God. So when we look at kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, these are synonymous words, synonyms, okay, and they mean the same thing, okay. So the kingdom of God refers to what? When you look at the word kingdom of, the phrase kingdom of God, it refers to what? Whose kingdom it is, basically. Yes, whose kingdom it is. And so whose kingdom it is? It's, it's kingdom of God, okay? And when we say kingdom of heaven, what are we saying? Huh? It's the same, it's the same yes. But when we say kingdom of heaven, what, what is our understanding? Yes, where it is from? Yes, the origin. So where is the kingdom of God from? Where is the kingdom of God from? Where is its origin? Heaven, right, yes. So where it comes from, it comes from heaven and it's not from earth, okay? So basically they both refer to the same thing. You had a question? Uh, can you give him the mic, please? Yeah. If uh, both were to be same, how is it so? Because uh, when we, the, the human understanding, my understanding is like, you know, you say kingdom of heaven, so it's like referring to heaven above. You need to speak a little loud. Uh, well, when you say king, uh, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are two, uh, both are the same. Okay, so my understanding is like when you say kingdom of heaven, it's referring to the he heaven above. Okay, and when you say kingdom of God, it's referring to heaven and earth. So... Is so it? it's the same thing. We we don't find any uh, you know uh, evident distinction in the gospels in the Bible. So we are coming to the conclusion that they are same phrases. But if you look at what uh, Jesus asked us to pray, he said, "Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven." Okay. So where is the origin of the kingdom of God, which is in us and The kingdom of God is here, okay, but where is his origin from? Heaven, okay. So what are we basically doing? We are bringing down what is there, the kingdom of heaven. What is the rule, the reign, the presence, uh, the lifestyle we are establishing here on earth, okay. So that is what we say that, you know, um, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven and we uh, and the verse that says you know whatever is um uh, uh yeah whatever is loose in heaven we lose it here whatever is bound in heaven we bind it here so what is the meaning of that that means whatever is not in heaven we we bind it here whatever we see in heaven we declare it here so what we see in heaven there's peace there's unity there's oneness there's no sickness um, there is joy, there is peace, there's righteousness, there's holiness. We release that here on earth. So just an extension of the kingdom here. And so they are actually basically meaning the same thing. There is no, you know, uh, uh, distinct distinctions between the two words. Is that clear? Okay. So, um, so the kingdom of heaven is talking about the origin and the kingdom of God is basically talking about whose kingdom it is. Okay. So both refer to the same thing and it basically is referring to the rule, the reign, the influence, the authority, the government of God in the hearts and in the lives of people. Okay. It's because the kingdom of God is in us. Okay, so uh, that's the way we are going to treat these terms, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Uh, we will be using it interchangeably, so don't get confused. Now, uh, we will all understand, uh, you know, 
uh, even as we talk about the kingdoms of God's rule, his reign, his authority, his influence, we will understand that, you know, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven mean the same thing. Okay. Now let's begin by looking at a very interesting verse. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 25, uh, verse 34. And can somebody read that, please? Basically here in Matthew chapter 25, um, verse 34, Jesus is giving us a picture of the end of days and he's talking about what is he talking about in Matthew chapter 25 closing to 34 verses 34 what is he sheep and the goats and he's saying how at the end of the age okay the sheep and the goats will be separated okay so keeping that in mind uh, let somebody can read Matthew chapter 25 verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Amen. This is a very powerful verse. Okay, I want all of you to read it for yourselves. Tell me, why is this a powerful verse? Why am I saying this is a powerful verse? Well, every verse in the Bible is powerful, but why is this verse powerful? Even before the foundations of the world, God had prepared a place for us in the heaven to inherit. Okay, thank you, Lucy. And to uh, sit at his uh, right hand okay. in the heavenly places. Okay, thank you. It is the biggest uh, inheritance, or you can say it's the most blessed inheritance one can inherit. What? The uh, uh, kingdom of God. Okay, to be part uh, of the kingdom is one kingdom. of the blessed inheritance that you have. Why am I saying this verse is powerful? Anyone else? What is Jesus saying? I want you to come and I want you to inherit this kingdom. When was this kingdom prepared? From the foundation of the world. Okay. So he's saying that this kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world and I want you to come and inherit it. Okay. It is, yes, it's a kingdom prepared for us and it's a kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Okay. So the New Testament, this phrase, the foundation of the world is found only 10 times and this is one of the 10 times that it is found. Now we know that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world right even before adam and eve sinned okay it's not then and it's, god said oh oh now what do we do you know uh, people have sinned so now what am i supposed to do but even before the foundation of the world even before adam and eve sinned god knew that they're going to sin even before that the lamb of god was slain so what does it uh, what understanding do we get from this Yeah, you quickly pass the mic, mm. sister. The yes, sister. The God is omniscient. He knew everything from the beginning, Be beginning of creation. He knew what would happen. Yes, he's omniscient, so he knows from uh, everything from the beginning to the end. Uh, it talks about God's plan and purposes. Yes. One observation is that. Uh... No, God is outside of space and time, okay. and He is eternal. He has no beginning and He has no end. Okay, we can we can tell it from, from this particular. Okay, we can say that from this verse. Okay, what does it to teach us? The Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. That the kingdom of, was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That means even before God created the world. Everything that he had planned and purpose, he already saw the completion of it. Right from the beginning to the end. Okay, Everything was completed in the heart and in the mind of God. That is why he, he's God, right? So everything that we see now is we're going to see in the future. Everything was completed in the heart and mind of God even before he unfolded it in history. Right? So even before... 
he uh, 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 inaugurated uh, the arrival of the kingdom of God, he already saw it through. Even before sin came into the world, the Lamb of God already was slain. It was a done, completed thing in the heart and mind of God. So where do we read this? The Lamb of God was slain for the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. Okay. Uh, can somebody read that? Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. I know you were I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it for you. Have a little strength, have kept Are you re reading Revelation 13:8? 13, 13:8. Eight? 13, eight. Yeah. 13, eight. Did I say 3 8? Oh, I'm so sorry. 13 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain even before the foundation of the world. Okay. So now when we're talking about a kingdom, we are seeing that this kingdom was prepared even before the foundation of the world. And what it simply means is this, that it was already in the heart of God even before creation began, even before God established the world okay so the kingdom of god is not something that god had planned in retrospect okay but the kingdom of god was something that he always had in his heart okay it was his intent even before creation and it was something that he had established even before the foundation of the world which means that one of the purposes of creation ties back to this intent. One of the reasons why God created the world ties back to this intent or this desire in his heart to have a kingdom. Okay, And it wasn't uh, you know, something that God thought after Adam and Eve came along or after Abraham came or after David came and established his throne and God said, you know, that he will establish his throne forever. It was um, not because of that or God did not think, oh, David is king. Uh, so maybe I should think about having a kingdom. It wasn't something like that. It was even before the creation of the world and it was the intent of God to have this kingdom prepared for whom? For us, for you and me. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Isn't that so wonderful? Yes. So uh, he wanted to have a kingdom of people, not a just kingdom of angels, angelic beings. He wanted to have a kingdom of people and that kingdom of people is you and me. So whenever I look at God's uh, redemptive plan or whenever I, uh, I uh, look at what God, what God has called us to or, you know, the spiritual blessings he's given us, uh, and what he's purchased for us on the cross, it really blows my mind because, you know, for this great big God who's so omnipotent to think of us sinful, weak beings to have this great plan and purpose for us. So what he thought about us is not something small. It's not something meager. It's not that, you know, something that, you know, we think for ourselves even, you know, some of us, even what we think about ourselves is so meager, so lowly. You know, but what he thinks about us is so big. So just imagine his plan to have this kingdom, you know, even before the foundation of the world, this kingdom for you and me. Okay. Uh, so what kind of people uh, is he thinking about? Many times when you think about the kingdom, you know, we think about a king, right? Because a king can only run a kingdom. And we think about who else? Kingdom consists of? king and people. people subjects okay so mostly when uh, the king's perspective of his subjects is what is his mindset about the people or his subjects he thinks of the welfare of the people he thinks of the welfare of the people okay if he's a good king but also why did god tell um, samuel that he did not want to have a king for the for is for, for the uh, for the nation of israel why? 
Now, when uh, when the Israelites ask for a king, why does what does God tell Samuel? Why didn't he think of giving a king to the nation of Israel? He wanted, uh, he wanted the people uh, to to acknowledge God as their king. He didn't, okay. didn't he didn't want them to 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 look towards an earthly king. Okay. Yes, he wanted him. Uh, you know, he wanted to be the king. But what else? What does he say? The reason. What is the what is the reason he gives Samuel? Says when a king comes, what will he do? Ah, he will rule over them. He will make them his slaves, right? So uh, when we think of people in a kingdom as subjects, you know, or there are subjects, there are people, there are slaves, there are certain uh, servants. But you know, God's intent was not to make us slaves or servants okay jesus said come inherit the kingdom okay now slaves serve in the kingdom okay subjects also serve in the kingdom but when jesus said i want you to inherit the kingdom what is he meaning that we are his heirs okay that we are heirs that's why the bible says we are heirs of god and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Imagine, you know, you are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. You know, we don't even have that the son to stand alongside with Jesus Christ, but that is the kind of authority, the kind, the way God thinks about us and looks at us is that he puts us in the same level as his son, that we are co-heirs with his son. Okay. So to inherit means to become a heir of the kingdom. So God's intent for us was to have a kingdom of people and his intent was not that these people should be slaves or servants in his kingdom, but they should be heirs in his kingdom. Amen? So that's so wonderful. When, when Satan, when we gave over the domain that God gave us when, you know, when he, uh, when God created us, when created Adam and Eve, he said, rule you know he gave them the domain he asked them to rule um and uh, you know um uh, uh subdue the earth he said rule and subdue the earth okay and he gave them dominion over the earth and he said rule and subdue the earth okay and so we see that you know uh, when god thought about us he thought about us as his heirs but when we gave that domain dominion to Satan, how did Satan treat us? As slaves, right? He treats us like slaves. Okay, so it's so important to look at these uh, distinctions and uh, to keep this in uh, mind. Okay, so that is why he called us into his kingdom to be heirs, not to be servants, to take ownership. He wants each one of us to take ownership of his kingdom and to extend the the father's rule, the king's rule here on this earth so when we go back to the book of genesis now okay the first chapter uh, verses 27 and 28 and look at god's creation you now can see it or read it in the light of what god originally intended to do okay so he intended to just not create things for the sake of creating it but now you see it with a new perspective. You see it with a new intention that he intended to prepare a kingdom for a people who will be his heirs. Amen? Yes? So when you read Genesis, now you, see, you read it, you see it with this perspective, with this original intent, what God had, that he intended to prepare a kingdom for a people who will be heirs of his kingdom or heirs of that kingdom. Okay? and when he creates the earth, when he creates Adam and Eve, he's now beginning to execute his intention that was in his heart. Okay. So can somebody please read Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. All of you with me? Able to understand? Yes, these are powerful truths. Okay. 27 and 28, please. So God create man in his own image. In the image of God, he create him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and 
multiply multiply fill in the earth and subdue it have dominions over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing they moves on the earth yes so here we see that what does god do when he created adam and eve he created them in his image and what does he do first thing he bless them yes he said be fruitful and multiply third thing fill the earth subdue it and have dominion now why is he saying subdue it you're above it rule over it subdue means what bring in control now why should they bring it into control when everything was in control <laughs> Yes or no? It was everything was perfect. You don't have to bring anything under control. Everything was in control, right? Sister okay, give me is, some. Sorry, is giving they, authority to the man. Okay, he's giving authority to man. Yes, he's saying have dominion. But why is he saying subdue? Who's the they? He's saying they don't overrule you. You overrule them. So who's the they? You rule over the fish of the sea. Everything was in perfect harmony and uh, unity. There was no need to subdue. Because uh, Adam and Eve would uh, sleep with a lion and a bear and nothing would eat them up, right? That was there was Everything was perfect. So why is God say subdue? You don't end up worshipping them? Who was there on the earth? Apart from Adam and Eve. Satan, yes. Okay. So he's saying subdue is more like a military term. You know, so subdue is a military term, right? So when God is saying subdue, he's basically saying subdue your whom? Subdue whom? Your enemy. Yes, subdue your enemy. But what happens? Do they subdue to the enemy? They actually, the enemy subdues them, right? And what happens? They give over their dominion to the to Satan. How do we know that? How do we know that? How do we know that Satan has taken over the dominion? If you look at um, Luke chapter 4, when Satan tempts uh, Jesus, what does he say? Worship me and I will give you the, the kingdom of this earth because it has been given to me. Did God give it to him? No. How did he get it? Man gave it to him. Right? So man gave it to Satan. And so he's saying, hey, it's given to me. You worship me and I will give it to you. Okay? So we see that even when you uh, read Psalms, it says the heavens belong to the, to the Lord and the earth is given to man. So when God gave man the dominion over the earth, you know, he does not overstep his, in his sovereignty, he gave it. But he does not step out of what he has done or established. That is why when Satan, many of you ask this question, why didn't God stop Satan? Okay. He knows he's going to, uh, you know, um, he's going to tempt Adam and Eve. They're going to fall in temptation. Why didn't he stop Satan? God is sovereign. He's all powerful. But in his sovereignty, he gave his dominion to man and he did not overstep that. Okay, he, he did not stop Satan and he did not even stop Adam and Eve because he's given them that dominion. So he never overstepped that. He never stopped that Okay, because he had given them the dominion. Okay, so that's another understanding that we can have. Okay, so here we see that um, God blesses man and woman and he says, I want you to subdue. I want you to have dominion. And then we see right here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that God introduced his kingdom right here in Genesis. He wanted to have a kingdom of people who would be heirs with him, ruling, managing, executing his government here on the earth. And he begins to unfold that plan. Yes. Yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, I will. I will tell you that. Um, can I just I tell you after the break? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on. So I think this is very powerful, right? Yes or no? 
says the kingdom of God is not something that comes up suddenly in the New Testament. You know, when Jesus comes and inaugurates it or when he says, oh, David is having a kingdom, so I should also have a kingdom and all that. But does not come up suddenly in the New Testament. But the kingdom of God was in the heart of God from the very beginning. It was part of his original plan and purpose and intent for mankind, for you and me. Okay. So when Adam and Eve fell, um, the whole kingdom plan was interrupted, right? Okay. But we see that uh, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain even before the foundations of the world, which means, in other words, the plan of redemption was already in place even before creation. Amen. The plan of redemption was already in place even before creation. So that's another amazing thing. Okay. So the plan of redemption that God thought to save you and me from sin was not something, you know, just to rescue you from and me from Satan's grip. But the plan of redemption was to bring us back to that original intent, to that original plan, that experience, that original experience that the kingdom that was prepared was prepared for a, for you and me, that you and I should be heirs of the kingdom. That is why when Jesus died on the cross, one of the many reasons why he also died on the cross is to get back that that power that was given to Satan, the dominion of the earth that was given to Satan, to take it back. And Jesus says, I give you the keys of authority. Okay, the keys of the kingdom has been given to you. So who is the you? Us and who are we part of? His kingdom, okay, or the church, right? The church, the body of Christ. So the keys of the kingdom. Keys resemble what? Authority. The keys resemble authority. So the keys of the kingdom has been given to uh, us as a church, okay? Um, so here, uh, ab apart from the many things that happen in the fall, but in this context, in Genesis chapter 1 that we read, there are two things that, you know, like, to bring our attention to is when Adam and Eve sinned and um, the fall took place, the first we know that the lordship um, of the earth, which was given to Adam and Eve, was now handed over to the devil, okay, or Satan, and Satan gained control or temporary control over the earth. And secondly, okay, the second thing that we can learn from um, this the fall that happened. The second thing is man's concept of being a king. Man's concept of being a heir of God was actually marred. Okay, was actually distorted. Was um, you know another word for marred is it was flawed. It was uh, damaged. It was ruined. It was stained. And, you know, that's why they went into subjection to the enemy, okay? And they developed a mindset of being slaves of Satan, okay? A mindset of being under subjection. So that is why, you know, even uh, after some of us have uh, are born again, we still feel that we are slaves of sin. We still feel that we are slaves of certain weaknesses. We still feel that we are not you know, in that place of authority, that we are not seated in that place of authority, we look down upon ourselves in a very low, in a demeaning manner because this mindset of slavery has not gone from our minds. And mindset of being under subjection has not gone into from our minds, okay? So the concept of being um, a king, a concept of being a heir of God was totally damaged, was flawed, was marred, and instead we went into subjection instead we went into being slaves of the enemy yes can you please take your uh... mart means it was damaged uh flawed uh flaw means something that is wrong it was uh ruined it was stained okay it was smart okay and uh, was this this was this what was this what god intended for us was this this is was this God's intention for us that we should be slaves of the enemy that should be that we should live on in subjection? No, 
because God created a kingdom that he wanted us to be his, people who would rule with him, you know, and would establish his government, his rule, his reign here on earth. But when that was damaged, when that was harmed, when that, that was ruined, so to say, you know, uh, God wanted to restore things back. Okay, so God wanted to restore things back. So we'll come back after the break. We'll stop here and we'll continue.